Hey class, Mr. Boydian here with a video to help make up for lost time with our uh, missed day for the storm. Uh, recording here from the friendly confines of my home. Uh, so we're here to talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus. We've seen part of it, but we're going to look at the, uh, the other aspect of it, the more powerful aspect of it in some respects. Um, we're not going to actually prove it. We'll prove the uh, theorem in class, but this will give us a sense of, uh, of what's happening. All right, so uh, be sure to take notes as you watch. Um, you know, don't write everything down, but the important stuff, certainly. Okay, uh, we're given that g of t is a continuous function, so some function g of t, and it's going to be the basis from which we develop a different function. And let me write that part here. Let f of x equal the definite integral from some number a up to x of g of t dt, where a is a real number. All right, so you may recognize this function here as an accumulation function. It accumulates from a all the way up to x the uh, values of g of t, and g of t is just some continuous function. So here's the actual theorem. So those are just the, uh, the uh, hypotheses, the conditions. From that, we can say that as a conclusion, then... f prime of x, which is to say the derivative of this business, so the derivative of f of x, which remember f of x is all of this, the derivative of that is simply g of x, which might seem a little anticlimactic, uh, just sort of, you know, you got f's and g's and derivatives of and all that, but if you look at it very carefully, it's saying something very powerful. It's saying that a derivative operation and an integral operation have the net result of canceling each other out, essentially, and giving you the function that you were integrating to begin with. So one way to think about this and one way to, you know, notationally and to uh, uh, procedurally work on this is simply to recognize that if you have an x here, uh, or, or at least if you have the same variable here and here, and it's just one of those variables, then essentially you can just plop in that number uh, sorry, that variable into your uh, integrating function, your integrand. Uh, so we'll see a, uh, an algebraic as well as a graphical example of this in, in depth in just a moment. But this is the theorem, uh, that the derivative of a, an accumulation function is the function that you're accumulating in the first place. So for some background, why, is this, why does this get such a fancy name, the fundamental theorem of calculus? Um, well, for two reasons. One is that this is saying that every continuous function has an antiderivative, which is a pretty powerful statement. It says nothing about differentiability. Any function that is continuous, or at least continuous on some interval, uh, has a unique, or has an antiderivative that you can develop from it, because this is saying from some continuous function, you can find the antiderivative. So that's one of its, uh, its big ideas. The second big idea, and arguably the more important one, is that it establishes differentiation and integration this is what we studied in the fall. This is what we've been studying since January. It says that they are inverse operations. They're, you know, intertwined in this in this way that they're mirror images of each other. And uh, now we've seen that uh, in the past in a couple of instances in terms of when we first developed the fundamental theorem of calculus to evaluate definite integrals. But this is a little more conceptual. Uh, it's sort of it's the basis from which the rule, uh, you know, for for evaluating something like this, it's the basis from which this rule c came from. So, like I said, we'll actually prove this theorem in class. Um, it's an interesting proof and a powerful proof, but for now, I just want to introduce you to the, uh, the mathematics of it. So here's an algebraic example. The fundamental theorem of calculus algebraically. Here we're given a, uh, an expression in red, this amount. It looks very scary. Um, and we're asked to take the derivative of this uh, expression, this definite integral, with respect to x. So as mentioned, the variable of differentiation, which is to say this right here, and the upper bound of integration, which is to say this variable right here, are the same. So all you got to do, very, very simply, what's the answer to this? It's just going to be replacing all of the t's with x's. And that's literally it. So I made this problem look scary on purpose because the fundamental theorem of calculus tells you that when you are integrating uh, or accumulating underneath any function, no matter if it's easy looking or scary looking, the derivative of that accumulation function is simply the function itself. 
So I've replaced all the t's with x's because that's my variable of differentiation as well as my upper bound of integration. Now, as a comment, uh, you will see uh, in the future this not just be plain old x. For example, it could be x squared or it could be x plus 2 or something like this. And we will talk about those, those you know, wrinkles uh, in the future. But for now, the fundamental theorem of calculus for an integrate for a accumulation function is simply the derivative being the function itself. So pretty straightforward there, I hope. Uh, graphically, is a little more nuanced. So let's take a look at a graphical, uh, a graphical example. This one uh, was actually on the 2016 AP Calculus test, in part at least. Um, so here we're given a graph of f, and uh, we're told that g of x over here is the uh, accumulation from negative 3 up to x of this graph, f of t dt. So presumably this is the t-axis. So the first three things say, what are g of 3, what are g prime of 3, and what is g double prime of 3. So before we actually start this, it's, it's worth kind of setting up uh, a hierarchy of sorts in terms of what's what. So we're told that g is whatever it said back here in the other part of the screen over here. It says that g is essentially the antiderivative of f, right? So I'm leaving off some of the detail. It goes here and here, but you get the idea. Well, the fundamental theorem of calculus says that the derivative of an accumulation function is simply this function itself, as we just saw on the previous slide. When you take the derivative of an accumulation function, all you do is you plop in the uh, variable into the function that you're integrating. So that means g prime is just going to be f, and furthermore, g double prime is going to be f prime. So do you see how g is sort of one step ahead of f at every step of the way? g is the antiderivative of f, g prime is just plain old f, g double prime is f prime. And you could imagine, you know, g third prime, third derivative is the second derivative of f, and so on and so on. So this sort of schematic will help you establish or help you interpret what the question is actually asking. So the question says, the first one says g of 3. Well, we saw this in a previous video. Let me use a different color here. Uh, that g of 3 is basically the area from negative 3 to 3 uh, underneath f of t dt, right? So that's just going to be this space from negative 3, which is here. So all of this. And it looks like, let's see, that's negative 2. looks like this. So you can just do a little bit of easy geometry to figure out those areas and add them together, recognizing that one of them is a negative area. So let's see, we have 3, 4, 5 is my base. And 1, 2, 3, 4 is my height. 5 times 4 is 20. Uh, cut in half because it's a triangle. So this would be 10. And I have a little sliver of a uh, triangle here, right? So that's 3, so 1 by 2. So negative 1 is my area there. Oops, trying to erase. Negative 1 is my area right here. So the value of g of 3 is simply uh, 10 take away 1, or 9. So this is just 9. Now, g prime, uh, we're not given, really, but down here we saw that g prime is f. So another way of expressing the problem as given, g prime of 3, so that this is g of 3 is 9, uh, let me use a different color again, uh, g prime of 3 is another way of asking the question, well, I can just say that's f of 3, because as we saw, the derivative of g is just plain old f, according to the FTC. So g prime of 3 is f of 3. Well, f of 3 is just the value at 3. Well, at 3, my graph here of f, at 3, my graph is negative 2. That's the y value, the output. So that would just be negative 2. So g of 3 is negative 2. Uh, g double prime of 3 is our next question here. g double prime of 3, well, once again, uh, if g is the integral of f and g prime is f, then as we saw for our sort of chart down here, uh, g double prime is just f prime. So this is another way of asking the question, what is f prime of 3? Now, we don't have a graph of f prime, but a, a derivative, which is what, what this uh, prime here is telling us, the derivative is the slope of a function, right? Uh, the slope of the tangent line. So this is basically asking, what is the slope at 3? Slope at 3 of the only graph we have, which is of f. So looks like at 3 I have a slope of because uh, this is a line segment, uh, down 2 and over 1, rise and run, so negative 2. 
So right away, even though I don't have a graph of g, I was able to figure out several important things about g. Namely, that at 3, g is a positive value. At 3, the uh, slope is negative. And the second derivative, or the concavity of g, is positive, because, sorry, negative, down, uh, concave down, because we have a negative second derivative. So a lot of information there just at that point. Uh, extending a bit further, where is g of x increasing and concave down? So this goes back to the stuff we learned back in December. Increasing, if you recall, since we're talking about g of x here, increasing is where g prime, oops, not a very good g, g prime is positive. Concave down, furthermore, means where g double prime is negative. Well, we can translate these g statements into f statements based on the little uh, chart over here. So g prime being positive is really saying, well, that's when f is positive. And g double prime being negative, well, that's really uh, saying that's where f prime is negative. So all we got to do is look at the graph and figure out where are these things true. Where is f greater than 0? Well, what does that mean? That means f is positive, right? It's above the x-axis. So right away, we can rule out this region right here. That's not going to be our interval for increasing because f, which is g prime, is negative there. Um, but it also needs to be concave down, which is to say f prime is negative. Well, f prime being negative means the slope of f is negative, and that means decreasing. So what I'm looking for, really, is a positive region for f, which is above the x-axis, or t-axis, I suppose, and a decreasing value, even though it's positive. So the only places where it is both positive and decreasing are here and here. So my answer would be from negative 3, sorry, negative 5, can't even count, uh, up to negative 3. I believe that's 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So there's one of our regions. And uh, so positive f, or, or increasing uh, g, and uh, decreasing f, or concave down g, would be also at 0 to 2. So, oops, 0 to 2. So we have information about g without a graph of g simply by accumulating f. All right, I'll see you in class.